So like, you can't argue with that. Like two different fields. Totally different fields, right. Chess, which is all brain, and Tai Chi, which is like a lot of movement, although Tai Chi and chess are related in some weird ways. But then again, everything is connected, so, right. But they are two different disciplines. I can tell you because I play chess and I've done some Tai Chi, not a lot. But yoga is Tai Tai Chi and yoga. Tai Chi does have an opponent element in some cases, but Tai Chi is is very similar to yoga. What we do in yoga is like Tai Chi. It's like some of the stuff is identical work, the actual work itself. The movements are slightly different, but the the um, the vinyasa flow is very Tai Chi. Like, well, like in those moments too, when you um, you talk about like pulling something in, you know, like uh, I'm trying to think of the exact like I don't know. I know in classes we've definitely done these moments where we're like like compressing, uh, yeah, uh, like that feels an awful lot like like Tai Chi ish. Yeah. Stephen, is yeah. Tai Chi under martial arts or yoga? It's really just Tai it's Chi. I mean, it, it's it's technically is a well, in the same way that yoga be, could be considered a martial arts. It, it's, it's more like a yoga, in my opinion. It's closer to a yoga, but it's, it is martial arts. And same thing with yoga. Yoga is martial arts form slowed down. So it's sword fighting. Yoga is sword fighting martial arts. The movements, warrior poses. All the warrior poses are katas. So it will make you a better sword fighter, if you should decide to. Take that. So it is like it's sort of an internal external art. It's basically Chinese yoga. Sure. I call Tai Chi Chinese mm-hmm. yoga because there's also Qigong, which is just the breathing. So there's like different. It's a huge branch. It's it's a big tree to to put it into one thing. But I would just call it Chinese yoga. And it does, there are people who compete, like what he competed in was something called push hands, which is, push hands is like a form, it's sort of one of the offshoots of Tai Chi, but it's again, it's an offshoot, it's a branch off of the big body of martial arts on the one hand and meditation movement on the other, I guess, you know. So a lot of people call it movement meditation. But if you're a fighter, and you compete and you use Tai Chi as your martial arts, then they would call it a martial arts. So it depends on mindset, I think, more than anything. So when you said earlier that what you got out of the art of learning was um, taking your yoga in chunks, mm-hmm. could you tell So what, what, what I like about Waitskin a lot, Josh Waitskin in the art of learning, is that he just has this ability to really break down processes of learning. And um, that's partially why I give a written set. And I give it a video set. And I have a pictorial version of it. Because different people will also break them down differently. But for instance, I don't know, think of any like type of accomplishment, let's say. What's an accomplishment that, you, that you've done? Learning to play chess. Learning to play chess, okay. So the first process, so what, he's, what I find that, that he does really, really well, and of course a chess master should be able to do this, is the first process of learning chess would be, perhaps very first, would be to understand that there's the black team and the white team, right? And that there's different specific movements that each player can do, right? And so he breaks down those processes really really well so like you might start off the game or learning that particular process by just learning what the movements of the specific players are right that's the first thing so what he would probably do is he would have you actually move each piece in the way that it moves so a knight would go two forward left one right two forward one left or Sorry, three forward, one left. And the, and the rook would go, you would move it forward and sideways because it moves horizontally, right? The castle. And I call it the rook, but the and castle. And how did you apply that to your yoga? Then? And then, so the way you apply it to, to doing the yoga classes is, um, is taking sequences down 
and breaking down the sets into pieces. So meaning the first chunk of the set is sun salutation A, hands to foot, sun salutation B series, and then the first through warrior four, right? So you have those sets and I call that whole chunk, that chunk is the sun salutation sequence, learning that set. So the process of learning the pieces of, of the long vinyasa. Does that make sense? Sure. So going through, and that's one chunk. And that's why in the beginning, we just did that one chunk. You guys remember? We did just that piece. And then we went to the next chunk of the class, which is the reverse warrior side angle sequence. Right? So that's the next chunk. So it's about taking complicated processes, winning a chess tournament, and breaking it down to how do you begin the process of actually doing that? The script helps a lot too. The script. Because the script gives you verbatim words to actually say the movements. So the script juxtaposed over the six sets of the sequence, right? And then the video to practice it in your body. That's how I apply his, that spatial learning. Right? Because you also learn things through space as well. So you learn, we, human beings typically learn on a linear fashion. Right? We see things from beginning, middle, and end. Generally speaking, not everybody, but most people see it that way. Okay? So break down whatever process you have. What you could do as a side study of his particular book, the, that thing is take any process you've ever learned and turn it into something called a process. It's called a process map. So uh, has anyone heard that term before? Process map? No? Okay, let me think of the best way to put it. So like a process map, let's just say, um, I don't know, loading a dishwasher. Let's just say. So something simple. As many of you know, there's a whole debate amongst households of how to load a dishwasher properly. I don't know if you guys know this, but when you get married, you're definitely going to figure this out if you have a dishwasher. And uh, most of us just go, put the damn dish in there, you know, like, just put it in there, it's fine. That's, that's my approach to washing dishes with a dishwasher. But my wife has a whole other process. She has a whole other process now. Okay, so a process map might be something simple as this. One, open the dishwasher. Two, take the dish in your right hand if you're right-handed or left hand if you're left-handed and hold it with your right hand and inspect the dish. Is it clean? If you've determined the dish is not clean, check it. Does it have large chunks of food that would not fit through the strainer of the dishwasher. If it does, rinse it off. Three. Four. Inspect the dish again. Five. Turn the dish so it's facing to the right. According to my wife, dishes, they all have to face the same way. Because if they don't, they don't get clean properly. She's right. It is true, actually. So you turn them so they're all facing the concave side faces to the right, and you set all the dishes in the bottom rack. Like a lot of people don't know that. In the bottom rack. Five. Side note, in parentheses, bottom rack is for dishes and silverware only. Secondary, bullet note, no wood. Okay? So this is a process map. On and on and on. So you can imagine it goes, so I don't want to go through the whole thing, but that's a process map of learning. Okay? Now it's important to understand this because when you're teaching stuff, your students are going to have to, well, privates especially, which by the way, privates is where you make most of your money teaching as a yoga teacher, generally speaking, the one on ones. That's where you can charge. I've charged up to 235, no, sorry, $300. For one private. What? Yes. 
So you guys are getting off easy. Yeah. So, yeah. What do you say? I need that. <laughs> you need that. Right. Well, it was somebody who lived. There's some details. It was someone who lived. It is true, but it was someone who lived in Chatsworth. And they wanted me to come. And I said, look, I'm not coming to Chatsworth, although now I might because it's by Stony Point. But um, I'm not coming to Chatsworth unless you're paying me for my drive time for that. It's too far. I, I would rather, I tried referring, it was a star, a famous star. I tried referring somebody else to this person. He didn't do it. That's where you make your big money. And, and this, those people, sometimes you get these like eccentric, really wealthy business people. And they, like they're really good at numbers, <laughs> but they're not in their bodies. So you have to break down process maps for poses. Okay, one, come to the front of your mat with your feet together. Sounds like a simple plan, doesn't it? It's clear instruction, front edge of your mat, feet together. What do we get? <laughs> the guy standing here, like this, right? So for those of you listening to the recording, I'm standing at the back of my mat with my heels touching. Technically, my feet are together. So that may not be the right process map to even get them in the postures. So they talk a lot about this, and there's another field of study that I like. It's called neurolinguistic programming. It has a weird name, but NLP. And it talks about very clear communication. Come to the front edge of your mat so your big toe knuckles are touching and your feet are a half an inch apart at the ankle. Your side edges of your yoga mat and the center lines of your feet are parallel to each other. That's very specific. And so when the student doesn't do that, then, then you have to really break it down them, for them. You have to realize, like, okay, this person doesn't do any yoga, and I'm going to... Your job, though, is to make them good at doing yoga, right? That's your process. That's what, you, that's what you're hired to do. So you break it down. Yeah, student, if that's not a critical alignment, why, why do we always have students stand and bring the toes and the heels and touch? That's not critical, is it? What was the, but the, the stand and the toes and the heels to touch? Yeah, you know, you start class. So the toe knuckles touch and the heels are apart about a half an inch. So they're actually yeah. not and touching. The, the ankles are a little apart. bit apart. Yeah, toes touch, heels slightly apart. So if, if, um, that's, uh, I mean, that, it, it is actually part of the alignment. It's not a critical alignment, it's not. But it's starting to actually show you, like, who's able to listen, whether the student is in their bodies. Do they understand physical instruction, things like that? So I do think it starts like a process of learning and process of discipline with your body. So it's not really that it's important. It's not. They could stand with their feet all apart. But the other reason that toes touching, what if you practice in a really dark space, like some crazy yoga scape or something? <laughs> and when their toes aren't touching, oftentimes your feet are then like this. Sure. So it's kind of that sort of, I call it the bending steel rule. To get people, like if you have a bent piece of steel, to get it to back to center, you have to bend it past its waypoint, past its center point, and then it'll come back to center. So when it comes to alignments like those, those are, that's like what I would call, it's the tradition. Um, but that's why. It's, it, there's a lot of cues that you and the student will learn about each other as they're not able to do it. So like it's, like it's not a critical alignment, but if the student cannot do that simple instruction, then you have to go up, hey, put your feet together, put your feet together, toe knuckles touch, ankles apart, come to the front of your mat. No, no, that's the back of your mat. Come to the front of your mat. Right? So you're like, you're, you're training them to be in their body and aware that even though they think. See, like also, for instance, if you're coming to the, so come, come to the stand, stand at the front of your mat. I'm trying to lecture so we can let our feet digest. But, but we're not going to do a bunch of physical stuff. I just wanted to just show you guys the difference. A lot of times what happens is, so bring your feet together so your toe knuckles touch and your ankles are apart a half an inch. So right now the center lines of your feet are in fact parallel, right? Right, they are parallel through the center lines, mm -hmm. right? So that, that is an important alignment because everything starts with your feet, right? All of the standing poses, it's like your feet are critical. Mm -hmm. Splay your toes, open the toes, grip the floor slightly, breathe, feel the left and right side. So you're already starting with balance. Now let's say, now close your eyes. Well, now feel your toes touch. Okay, now step your feet apart. And now just naturally, like just like hop side to side with your left foot and your right foot like this, close your eyes. And now look down at your feet. 
Okay, now, some of your feet are pretty straight, but like your right foot's turned out about a three to four millimeters. Yours are pretty straight, but I'll bet most people, one foot is turned out more than the other when they do that. Okay, so it doesn't seem like it's an important alignment. But in fact, so now close your eyes and bring your feet all the way together, toe knuckles touch. Close your eyes, totally close them. Now look down at your feet. Now look how closely aligned they are and lined up again that they actually are, right? So if you look down and you see like, oh, in fact, my feet are pretty darn good. Like the alignment's pretty good. Did I just say darn? <laughs> darn. They're pretty good, by golly. Um, then you can, you can actually assume that you're already starting the process of what's called basically proprioception the feeling, sense, and awareness of spatial placement in your body. That is a sense. That's actually a skill that not everybody has. Do you ever have people like bumping into you? Do you ever go to like certain places? I don't know, for me, certain places that people are always bumping in. I'm like, why do I always get bumped into at these delis? I go to like these old, like, these old delis and like all the old people are bumping into me. And I'm like, you know, like, that, yeah, everyone's bumping into me. All right. So, that's why. So there's like a bunch of little reasons why. And also, if I keep saying to somebody, come to the front of your mat with your feet together, and they keep not doing it, then I know, like, all right, right away, I know that I've got to work with this person. This person's not in their body. Okay? So little things like that. All right, let's go ahead and sit back. We're not, I assume, how many of you ate a big lunch? Did you eat lunch today? Yeah. We just ate. So I'm not going to, that's partially why we do some lecture and stuff. Plus, I like, talk. I like talking. <laughs> but there are a bunch of topics that we probably wouldn't. It's just like the books. You know, I know that not everyone's going to read all their books by the 8th or 7th class or whatever it is. Today's the 8th class. Um, but by now, um, I do want to start going through some of these other points. So The Art of Learning, if you haven't read it, it is a life-changing book. doesn't matter whether you're a teacher or not. You will learn. It also motivated me to learn Spanish as well, that book, because I had kind of given up on learning it, because I just said, you know what? Some people can learn two languages. I guess I'm not one of those people. And then I was like, no, 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 no. Josh Waitzkin would be standing right over your shoulder going, Stephen, learn. <laughs> you know how to learn. How Don't listen to the devil. Huh? You will learn. He's kind of like, he's like a California kid or something. No? Or no, no, he's from back east. Um, okay, so that book will motivate you to actually learn new things, whatever it is. And also there are studies that show, by the way, that people that actually study second languages and are constantly learning new things, that it actually like makes your brain function better for some reason which we don't know, I don't know why that is, but it's like it opens up another language, for instance, opens up like another Pathways. portal into your brain. So it actually like, it compounds, just like fitness. You know when your muscles get stronger, you get high density muscle? You actually burn calories when we're, we actually are burning calories, more calories resting than some people are burning even when they're walking. Because high density muscle requires a higher metabolism. And they compound. They like, they kind of, they create um, an exponentially higher calorie burning effect, right? To a certain degree, there's a point where you're not going to burn a thousand calories sitting on your butt, but you will burn more calories at resting. Okay. So if if you can uh, try and finish that by the end of the season, by the end of these, we have two more classes only. By the way. So it's, like I said, it goes quick. So we have two more classes. We're going to, before you know it, Trump's going to be out of office. <laughs> that seems like okay. a lifetime. <laughs> it will be a blink yeah. of an eye. Okay, so that brings us to our next topic, performance and humor. <sighs> okay. Have you ever done a really boring class? Have you? Okay. <laughs> I can say about this. Crack a joke. <laughs> I have, I actually, one of the first yoga classes I did after I had been exposed to yoga, but I didn't really like take it seriously. But then I actually went to a class 
in a gym. And it was so boring. Like, it was just boring. Started with classical music. You know, literally just... It was just boring. I was just like... Ah. I was just thinking... It started with, like, classical music. <laughs> and then it was like... It was like this woman is, like, very British. Who um, taught it. She's like, all right, class. Start off in child's pose. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Okay, so, so one must be careful to never forget. You know, we, I think I talked about this a little bit. It's going to relate to our next topic, so I won't get too much into it. But remember that they could do yoga with a book. You could put your yoga class down on a piece of paper, stand over it, and do yoga at home if you wanted to. Right? The reason that we do group classes... Well, let me ask you guys. What are the reasons? What, but give me like a one-word term. But let's, talk, let's try not to repeat each other. But like, let's start from left to right this time. So what is one reason you do a yoga group class? Uh, pushing you harder. Pushing you harder. Okay, so harder. You, you know you're going to work harder in a group class. Right? Okay. Motivation. Yeah. Motivation. Yeah. Like seeing other students who can do more. More than you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's motivating, yeah. I think. Yeah. So you work harder because you're in the aura of other people who work hard, right? So it makes you work hard, mm-hmm. right? And then Amy? Yeah, and you feed off that collective energy. Collective energy, but well, that's, yeah, I think collective energy. I don't know if I can say it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, I mean, exactly it's, 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 it's another one. Though. Let's try to think of another one, though. What's another reason? What's another? I'm trying to get to the only reason. Um, All right. I don't know. We could go with that. To hear Stephen's joke. Okay. All right. There we go. Ah, good way out. That was a good one. Very, very smart. And I do it because I like to be around smart people. Okay. Anyway, Stephanie. <laughs> Dynamic? The group energy. The heat. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the heat, so the temperature, the, the okay. Mm-hmm. That connection that you feel being in that class. Right, like the group connection. So it seems like this is a pretty strong one, isn't it? Like the group. Mm-hmm. So like the pack, the pack mentality, right? That we have. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Uh, okay, Lisa? Um, I was going to say... How's that floor doing, by the way? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Everything oh, more today? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say inspiration all the time and you're being taken in the same way all the time, sometimes when you go to a totally different person, you can have a break. Mm-hmm. And if you're watching the same video of the same person or whatever at home, there's no opportunity to maybe go deeper or find some new things, I think. Mm-hmm. That's one of the great things about going to a class. The right, inspiration new things. And yeah. The, yeah, that new way of seeing something. Mm-hmm. Or someone might inspire you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah, you're mm-hmm. inspired. You're inspired. It, it, it's very inspiring, I think, to go to classes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say variation. So, like, when you teach me poses that I've never ran into before. Mm-hmm. It's a different kind of challenge, I guess, coming to classes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and you can ask questions, you know? And sometimes yeah. people can't go into postures. It's nice to have a teacher to give them a modification. So they're not frustrated. Mm-hmm. So safety could be one. Safety is good. Safety. Yeah. Right. Of the energy of the teacher. Mm. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, so it's all of these little things, right? Why we go to a class. And that that is definitely a factor. Um, and then another one, too. I, I do think that yoga classes have an element of a performance in them. There is a performance element from the teacher and from the students, too. But I do want to talk a little bit about performance and humor. 
So that's one of the topics of today's class. Um, and the reason that it, that I, well, I think you guys, I think it, the reason is so obvious why I'm bringing it up in my class is that, um, I think it's a couple reasons. One, working out can be kind of hard and grueling for a lot of people. And a lot of people really dread working out in general. You know, like I know people that don't work out at all. They hate it that much. Matter of fact, Trump doesn't work out. <laughs> so, not surprised. Oh, <laughs> so I, I don't. I mean, again, I'm not saying I'm not that politically inclined anyway. But so when we train, <laughs> I'm trying to be neutral. I'm I'm neutral as I can be. With uh, but I but he is a great source of humor for us, isn't he? Let's give him that. Okay. Funny in a sick way, like in a train wreck way, but. It is a form of a source of humor. He would be and, more fun if he wasn't president. Right? right, I know, I know. But sometimes life gives you, you know, gives you. gives you what it gives you. So you got to make do with what you have, right? So I think we would all agree that we we do classes partially to work out, partially to have the group environment, and also maybe a little bit to be entertained. I've had some teachers that were really, really, like, funny or whatever. Like, in some weird way, there was an entertainment element to that class. It wasn't like he was up there cracking jokes all the time, whatever he was teaching. Or, like, I had one teacher that was, um, like, really, really uh, mystical and spiritual, but in a really, like, in a way that I really resonated with. Not, like, God said do this, but like for me, that's kind of what you hear in temples, like when you go to, when you go to a lot of temples, like the Lord said thou shalt not fornicate or whatever it is, and I'm like, God, I'm just a sinner, I'm just bad, like, you know, I'm a total sinner, and I remember feeling that guilt and feeling like all these weird, but feelings I didn't want to feel in a spiritual environment, and yet the performance of this teacher, like for instance, I remember he would walk in and he'd say, this is not a gym. Right, because I was this was in a gym. It was a gym actually. But he would walk in and he would say, "This is not a gym. This is a sacred space." Now, taking a deep breath, and like just saying that, and then he would say things like, "Like um, I want you to imagine like a stone temple. There's pillars in the room. He basically was building like a yoga scape, but there wasn't a yoga scape, so you couldn't do it. It didn't have any special lighting. It was actually." Kind of an ugly gym. It was like a wood floor gym with weights, and it was kind of a dark. It was just not a really pretty space. But he would like paint the colors of the environment, turn the lights down, so we turn them all the way down, so it was dark. So it already like affected the mood of the space. And he would turn it into. He would take like a dingy old gym and turn it into like a sacred space, and it was entertaining, and it was like it. I remember doing it, and another thing he said to me that I found as well, was, which is related to more to performance, was um, he would get you to see ideas of consciousness, what we call God, but like in different uh, containers, if you will, like in different ways of seeing that consciousness. For instance, God is in every breath, something really simple like that, like but he would paint it in a way, he would say like, listen, consciousness isn't just when you go to temple and you go and your preacher says this or that. It's there, but it's in ev to a yogi, it's in every single breath. It is not intangible, it is tangible. It's in everything you see. He's really saying what it says in the Bible too, but he's saying it in a context that really made sense to the to me and the people around me. That was a form of performance. Again, maybe he wasn't trying to perform in the sense of like, you know, look at this dance move or whatever, but it is a form of performance because it's like the way he would set it up was uh, entertaining. It was entertaining and inspiring. And again, I'm not saying that, I, that I'm against the preacher or whatever, but it's just the way he would bring it about, the way he would talk about it would really shine a light on it in the, in the right way. And then um, humor. So humor is 
I don't know that it's everyone's teaching style, personally. Like, these are choices. I think that humor in a yoga class is disarming in a good way. A lot of people come into yoga and they're like, uh, you know, whatever, my wife brought me here, and these, they're mostly full of crap. And, you know, there's a lot of yoga teachers like, like, um, like Bikram that have sort of tarnished the name of yoga and spirituality. They've done some bad, you know, we think. And, and again, like, I don't know, like, I know he was, something went wrong, whatever it was. And so, <laughs> I'm recording, so I'm trying to be careful, I'm trying to be politically correct. All right. But obviously, you know, there was some issues there. And we have to remember to, like, in every situation that we go into, I think, that we have some element of fun and that it is something that makes the student feel like they... You know, they're coming in, they're also paying money, too. So let's not forget, there's that as well. They're paying money. So you should entertain a little bit. I don't know that you need to go overboard with it. And like, for instance, I try not to use jokes that are at the expense of my students. Right? A lot, at least. Not a lot. I won't say I'll never do it, like hazy. I'll set up hazy, but not, I don't make fun of them. I'll just like say, like, hazy, is that okay with you? Something like that where it's like I'm incorporating him into the, into the joke, and obviously it's, a, it's an inside joke between me and one of my students who comes all the time. But the, the funny factor, the humor factor, there has to be in, in and again, this is, this is my teaching style, and I don't know that everyone needs to be this way. Entertaining, yes. Performance, sure. Humor, I don't know that that's everybody's going to be your thing. I personally do recommend some humor in the class because it breaks the um, holier than now kind of, you know, like when people, sometimes with yoga and spirituality, it almost becomes a big ego thing. Has anyone seen that? Where like they get like an like a arrogance to them. When you make a joke in class, it shows that you're human too. There's something about the laughter that breaks up this kind of, I don't know, this energy that does happen in yoga sometimes where it's so like intense because you're working and you're holding a pose. Having the humor element disarms, it does a couple different things. One, it disarms the student that's there, you know, the, let's just say like, or like another one is like a guy on a first date and he likes the girl and the girl brought him in or whatever. You know, or, or maybe it's a guy and a guy and they are on the first date, whatever. And they, and the guy is like dragged there because he likes the other guy and he's there. And so he's like in there like, damn, you know. And so if you can make him laugh, there's a good chance that you're going to win him over to the practice. And, and again, I've seen this happen actually. I've, I've witnessed this to be true. So humor is a good thing, right? How many of you like to laugh? Right? Does anyone not like to laugh? Right? Not many of us, right? So humor is a good thing. So I try to do three jokes. Sometimes I do more. But like three something funny in every class. Even my teacher trainings. That's a lot. Three. That's my rule. Three. But it doesn't always have to be like... It doesn't have to be like an actual joke. Like, right. why did the chicken cross the road? Because he's working on his stretch or whatever. You know, it, it can be something else. It could be like, um, you know, like I was saying, like you could even call out a student. Like today I called out a student in the back, Jill, because I was like, today's an extended meditation. And then Jill's like, oh no. Like she's kind of griped. And then I said, I don't remember what I said, but I said something just for you, Jill. And like the class heard that. And so they also, you know, like they can respond and, Probably Jill was not the only person that was feeling that, right? So when, when I said, like, you can just relax, it's actually going to be easier than anything, and then address it a little bit in the meditation, it also feeds to that idea of performance and humor, right? Because you take something that's not so fun, and then you turn it into something that's funny. Which is oftentimes, like, I know you're a comedian, right? Amongst many other things, right? 
So like, isn't reality the funny thing? And I know you are, definitely, because I've seen your stuff. So like, when you do your skits, don't you think of reality? Yeah, the like, universal themes that if, yeah, so if you're feeling it, somebody else's. Right. You play upon things that, you, that are truthful. Yeah, and then you exaggerate them or yeah. whatever you do, right? Because I know you did the one that's really funny. I've watched it twice already. She did one where a guy comes into the, it's a video that's on Facebook. And you know, I'm sure you guys have seen, been in similar situations where somebody next to you like just sneezes all over you. And you're like, or like he coughs, but you know, it's like that. And then like the next, she's like, what the hell is going on? I don't know, what did he say to him? Something like, well, first of all, like, uh, what was that? And then he's like, oh, just something in my throat. Like, right. Are you sure? And then, yeah, he plays it off. Yeah, he plays it off. And then, and then I'm supposed to, like, Netflix and chill with this guy, right? And then just coughed. And I'm like, okay, I'll be right back. And then I come back. And I'm, like, slowly, like, covered in, like, <laughs> sheets and towels and everything. So I'm right. like, okay, now we can Netflix and chill. <laughs> right. Yeah, so it was like, and that's a situation we've all been in. I showed it to my wife because my we go to movies. And literally, like, it doesn't matter that it be hundreds of people. We'll sit right behind the guy who's coughing and sneezing the whole time. And like, my wife will be like, literally do that. She like, literally, like, I feel like it's like, and she looks at me every time and it's funny. It's, it's, it's funny, but it's not, you know, it's, it's reality, but it is funny. And so like, you can even talk about stuff like that in class, you know, the guy's sweating, you know, like, you know, relax your eyes, relax your jaw. I know you're seeing that sweat, it's about to get, on your mat, just breathe. Even if there is a drop of sweat or whatever, you know, like the really sweaty person next to you, you will survive, you know, whatever it is. So you could talk about yoga related jokes. Although like you wouldn't pinpoint one guy, you wouldn't say like, Joe's sweat, you know, like, but you could joke about the idea of we're in this room with a bunch of sweaty people. That's so it's funny, like, like Saturday I did, I did a class and the guy got up with his mat and it's full of sweat and he, it poured on the girl as he was walking out the door and she goes, yeah, it's disgusting, you're so gross. And this is in the middle of class and I was like, I was thinking the same thing so I didn't know what to say. I was like, that is kind of disgusting. But I didn't say anything so I didn't know how to make a joke out of that. <laughs> Actually, that might be a situation where you don't joke about it. Right? That might be a situation where Let it go. what you do is actually you tell the guy, you go, you know, when you picked up your yoga yes. mat, next time you pick up your mat in class, dude, like, you know, pour it in the ground or wrap it up and cover your towel. You need to bring two towels next time. Please just be mindful of that. <laughs> I was like so in shock. But she'll live. Like, she'll live. Out on her. Like, she'll live. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> that was so really gross. Really I'm glad that wasn't me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah. It's that's really gross. Like, yeah. So that is a topic, and that's something you could make fun of, but not if it actually happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so not right after it happens. It's all about the time. Not a good moment. All right, so I want you to think of three funny situations in yoga classes. How about farting? Another one. Man. You know, that's another one. People farting. I don't know what you guys ate. Somebody ate some beans. Or another one would be like, um, <laughs> I don't know, Steve. Don't say who it is as long as it's just. Someone ate some beans? <laughs> Somebody ate some beans here or what? Look, guys, if you need to, just go outside for a minute. Come back in. Or someone comes in reeking like weed. Or yeah. something like, God, that weed, you know, that weed must be really good because it's strong it's and I can awesome. smell it. Or whatever, like, just think of three funny yoga situations that you could crack jokes about, but that wouldn't. But the rule that I have is that, generally speaking, don't pinpoint one student. Yeah. So you're not d demeaning one person. Unless it's a really secure student who's a friend of yours and you've talked about it, whatever, and he doesn't mind. You know, like, if that's the case, you could do that. That's okay, because it's not going to kill anyone if you do that. Those are only special students that you do that for. All right, so performance. Um, performance, what's another level of performance? What could be another one? Aside from humor. Motivating or encouraging people mm -hmm. harder and pushing through. Mm -hmm. So voice, right? So motivating voice. What's another one? Yes, 
demoing. So demonstrating in a class, right? That's motivating. When someone sees that you can do handstand or something, that motivates them to do handstand. And they also have a certain level, maybe, of respect for you and trust that, oh my God, this guy actually can do handstand. That's kind of weird. I didn't, I've never seen that person do yoga. And then they see you do handstand. Or they see you do some other hard pose with these. And so that is a form of performance. And that is motivating. Right? It does more than just motivate, too, because it also is motivation and it's also um, you could teach them while you're in the pose. So it's demonstrating, it's partially your job. And it also um, visually looks cool. Yes. And visually, some people yeah. are visual learners. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's visual. So that's another thing. Visual performance, music, right? Another one. Music, yeah. Today we did the, I told you oh, I was yeah, going to do that, that hip hop yeah. set, right? So that's, that's another thing to consider, that it's entertaining. Hip-hop music is entertaining, you know, or whatever it is. Like, today was hip-hop and soul. I, did, I played, like, it was a mix. It was nice. It was a mix. But it was, like, Stevie Wonder. Um, yeah, that's what you said. It's fun to come to a class because of the music. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, music. music. Music's critical. Kind of big. Music's important. Yeah. Music's big. That's why we spent, we spent a whole session just talking about music. What else? Is that spiritual? Spiritual, sure. That is part of it, I do think. A yoga teacher, we are yoga, we're yogis. It should have a spiritual element to it, in my opinion. If it doesn't, it's empty for me. When I do classes, I really don't like classes that are purely physical. Not yoga classes. I don't mind if I'm doing booty bump or whatever. You know, so. <laughs> Booty bump. There's classes. There's one of my friends teaches a class called like Booty Camp or something. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like Booty Camp. It's called. Yeah. But it's not Boot Camp. It's Booty Camp. Booty camp. Yeah. Or there's another one that's Booty something booty too. Like Booty what? Booty Bake. Yeah. There's like Booty Bake and there's Booty this. I don't know. Whatever it is. <laughs> I, if it's there, fine. But if it's a yoga class and it doesn't have any spirituality in it. You're missing just a huge part of the, of the form, right? Don't you guys agree? Yeah. There's a big part of it. Like for me, that's like, that's kind of the, um, the reason I would do yoga class. I wouldn't do, you know, if not, I have those other classes that I mentioned, you know, and they're great too, but they are what they are. Like they're just going to get my body in shape, get my heart rate up. I think we live for those moments of humor, too, you know? People that can make you, if you can make people laugh, that's a big, big part of why people will be drawn to you as a person. I love being around people that make me laugh, at least occasionally, right? Don't you guys? So, again, something to consider. You, it has to be in your personality, too, though. So, like, you can't contrive it. I mean, well, actually, I won't say that. You could do it and make it where it becomes a contrived situation. But I would rather you process that over time and learn if you're gonna do that and it feels right for you to do put humor in your class, make sure you develop that part of your being somehow. So that has to be incorporated into your, into your fiber as a person. Your strengths might be something else. Your strengths might be in concentration or in meditation or in physical brute physical strength or something else it might be that quality to you but you do that's about finding your voice which is another i think finding your voice is it's covered a little bit market demand and personal preference it's kind of covered in that topic but we'll talk a little more about that later we did talk about imitate uh imitate integrate create that's about finding your voice. Okay, so that does, that's that topic. If it's not genuine, I, like for me, if I was suddenly like a Trump, if I really was like a Trump lover, I just wouldn't crack jokes about Trump or something. You know, that's all. Just find the ones that are, that do resonate for you. Find real situations that everyone, that a lot of people experience and then highlight them in a funny way. Whatever it is. Yeah, that, that whole conversation of bringing politics in. Like, 
you obviously don't hate Trump, so I think your jokes are. I there's a teacher who hates him, and she's always talking about him, and it's, a, it's such a downer. Right, so right, know, right, right. Uh, yeah, I don't want to hear that. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, if it's genuinely a lighthearted joke, yeah. it's fine. Like yeah, I don't. But you can feel the difference. Yeah. I don't. I mean, I don't mind the color orange. I don't have a big issue with it. So, you know, <laughs> it's all good. I mean, I think they're all a little crazy. Like Obama is actually the only one that I think was partially sane. But he was like most presidents are a little crazy. Um, but I do think that you can crack jokes about it. Well, you have to be careful if you're in, let's say, Texas. And there's a huge everyone's lawn has a Trump sign on it. Yeah. I'd probably keep my mouth shut about Trump in Texas, you know, or wherever it was. I don't know. Maybe Texas isn't, but I wouldn't joke too much about. Although I joked about Obama, even, and I liked Obama, but I joked about him because he's a president, and so I would joke about how smooth he was or whatever. You know, like I joke about other things. It was just harder to make really funny jokes about Obama, where people would totally laugh because he was too smooth. So I would joke about. Him. Like who, some somebody else, some other figure or whatever. Okay, any questions on performance and humor? Any serious questions? No? <laughs> Lovely. Okay, good. Or actually, not good, but we'll move on. Uh, enjoying work while making a living. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that. Does that sound, does that sound important? Partially the reason why I decided to teach yoga is because when I teach yoga, I really feel like I'm enjoying myself when I'm doing it. The time goes by, I don't feel like I'm at work or whatever. Like most people wake up, I've got a good work, and you know, like every day, there's like this whole thing. And it's like, why are you doing that to yourself? You know, part of that I am consciousness, the beginning phase of that meditation that I was, that you guys did on the, on the website, today is that everything we do is an extension of our own being, right? Whatever it is that we do in life. And that the universe will provide regardless and that you are part of this universe. And so you don't have time to be doing things that you're not really into, at least for the majority of your time, right? If you're going to spend 40 hour work weeks doing something you don't love. Now, mind you, that's 40 hours of your waking life, right? Your waking active hours. Because when you come home from those eight hour days that you don't enjoy, those are half awake. So those hours count as less in a way, right? Because if you're tired from going to a job, being in a editing booth all day long, and you come home, you're not gonna wanna do much else but eat and go to sleep and then go back to work and wait for the weekends, like most people do. But that's why our society is so messed up. You know, People that are doing jobs that they like, they don't, they don't feel like their life is going to waste. They don't. They don't feel like, you know, like, whatever, like, as much, as much. Yes, you could find the occasional person who has who suffers from depression, there's always an exception to the rule. But even that person, if they started doing a job they liked, it might actually help their depression. It might even heal some of their depression. Right? But if it's truly clinical depression, then that's a different story. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the general population of, let's say, the 85 percentile of healthy individuals. <clears throat> You might say, well, you can't make a living as a yoga teacher. And it's hard to make a living as a yoga teacher. That's true. But I think that it's harder to not make a living at something that you like doing. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to piggyback off of another gig, which actors often, you guys all know what I'm talking about. So like I have a friend who's an actor. She acts at uh, Disneyland. She's still acting. But she's like a Disneyland, you know, character. And she does plays and stuff too. And she does like, she also does like, um, like character work where she does, she'll dress up like a princess and do like parties and things like that. So like, she's always working though. She's always working and she's generally pretty happy. 
She doesn't make a ton of money doing that. Like Disneyland pays a little, you know, it doesn't pay a huge actor's wage. It doesn't pay you the, I don't know what scale for a day. It's like a speaking gig. Mm, okay. 800 yeah. bucks? Uh, let's just say it's 500 bucks a day. It doesn't pay 500 a day. All right? <laughs> it doesn't. It pays like 100 bucks a day or whatever. Somewhere around 100 bucks a day. So you have to make a decision as to whether you're going to be one of those people that is going to live all of their life for the weekends. Or if you're going to live all of your life, not just for the weekends, but for the whole life. For every day of your life. Or let's say 90% of the time. Right? You have to make that decision. Hopefully you make that decision while you're still young enough to where you are in the workforce so that most of your life doesn't go to doing something you don't like doing. Jim Carrey gives a really good speech about this. And he talks about how you can fail. This is the thing he said about his dad. His dad, I think, I think his dad was like, an, and I'm just going to make it up. It like his dad was an accountant, but he really wanted to be an actor, let's say, or whatever, or a teacher or something else. And he failed as an accountant. And he said, he's like, I saw that. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be a comedian actor. Because I can fail at something I don't even want to be doing. You know? Which is interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 36,500 days is this lifetime. That's 100 years, roughly. Right? If you had $36,500, you wouldn't be wasting 80% of those dollars on buying sewer pipe, something you don't really want, right? But yet human beings do that. Yeah. Why? You know? And then why do we get surprised when we hear about all the craziness of the world? This man, just out of nowhere, went up and, you know, did some crazy thing. It's things like that. It all added up. Had that person been a yoga teacher from the time he was younger, surrounded by wonderful yoga people and in an environment where it really made the personality flourish, they would have been doing something a lot different, most likely. So the root of a lot of our um, disdain, I think, is from doing work that we don't enjoy, at least somewhat enjoy doing. Right? Now, do I... Do you guys have any questions? I'm curious. <laughs> I, could, I, could, I hear them already. I'm feeling them. Any questions about it? Or no? That's such a great way of looking at life, though. Fail at what you love rather than what you don't. I mean, yeah, or what, fail at what you don't like. You could fail at what you don't love, so might as well do what you love. Yeah, right on. Right? And there is a trade off. So, for instance, as many of you guys know, and I'm really proud of it, I built my website again. Yeah. I redid it all colorful. I made it into more of a yoga scape looking website. I enjoyed like an hour of doing that. <laughs> Did I enjoy five hours of, ten hours of doing it? Not really, to be honest. Not really. But it is a little bit of a trade-off. I want a new website. I really want to showcase the scapes. And I really wanted to get it done. And I couldn't find anyone to do it within a reasonable amount of time. So there's a trade-off even with it, excuse me, within the yoga field. That when you are a yoga teacher, not all the aspects of your career are going to be all, you know, love and rockets. You know, it's not. It's not all love and rockets. It's like sometimes I got to fix the sound system or I have to climb up and, you know, check the change out the projector light. Or, you know, I'm trying to think of the things I really don't like about or whatever. Sometimes like that I'll have a, a unpleasant student on rare occasion that I have to deal with. Or upset who, teachers. Or upset teachers sometimes. But that's more running a business. So that's like sort of a different... I try to separate it. But, it, but yeah, upset teachers. Where there's like these like politics. And I'm like, you guys are supposed to be enlightened masters already. <laughs> like we shouldn't even be talking about it. Like really. Like some of the stuff is so small that we should rise above it. Really. Like really, really we should. Now, that's not always the case and in those cases I have to referee I have to be you know and that's something yeah I don't enjoy being the referee where I'm like in the middle between two yoga teachers or two staff members but it is 
It comes with the territory of running a business. As yoga teachers, you might have to get in between two students. I've been in that position. This student hates this one because this one, whatever, poured their sweat on their <laughs> mat. So then they're getting in an argument because the next class, the woman said, you know, listen here, you know, jerk. Go, can you practice across the way? And the guy said no. And it becomes this whole thing. So, you know, it's, it all, it's not all love and rockets, but for the most part it is. For the most part. And so there is a trade-off. There is some where you still, even within. But the question then becomes, if you are doing something that is towards a greater good. So to me, like, yoga is the way to change the world. It's one of the ways to change the world. That's how I see it. If I die, my last breath is in a yoga class. My life will have gone to the service of humanity. And I'm okay with that. Right? So a question might be, and again, this goes back to uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, if you find something that you're willing to die for, he said, the way he said it exactly, his quote is, a person who hasn't found something they are willing to die for isn't fit to live. And that's why, like, I don't condemn the death either. He was doing what he came here for. So, yeah, I'm sad that he died because he could have gotten a lot more done. But I don't see he was doing, like, he lived a good life until the day he died because he was doing something he believed in. Right? Wouldn't you want to be one of those characters? Isn't that? Or Gandhi, too. Again, another person died doing what he was here living for, right? So if you died today, could you say, yes, I did all the things that I felt, like I did the things that I was believing in and, and doing to help humanity? And if the answer is no, why, right? Why, why aren't you doing that? At least some of the time, you know? If so, if you want to act, act. There's plenty of plays and kids' plays and kids' acting. You know, there's all these things. Like side gigs, that could be, right? Mm -hmm. Which I'm sure you've done. And probably, probably you guys have done. And maybe you don't want to talk about it, but you've done it. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so that's, those are the things that you can do. Plus, you guys got movie. Like, you have your own movie channel on YouTube if you want it. There is no excuse now. Right? As yoga teachers, too. Like, I have my own movie channel and I post on it all the time there's tons I don't know if you guys ever go to it but I post stuff on it all the time I have a SoundCloud page a YouTube page I have a whole thing there's a whole channel just waiting for you to teach from so you can make a living teaching yoga don't let people steal your thunder it's not true if they say oh nobody you know you might be able to make a living but I can't that's that's their own uh, subscription. Don't subscribe. Right? Or that's their prescription for you. Don't subscribe. That's all I can say. When I first started teaching yoga, it was not a good environment to make a living. You guys at least have enough yoga studios where you could, like, make, you could scratch out a living. You don't make a ton of money for teaching group classes, but you could make a living teaching yoga. When I was doing it, you really didn't have enough studios to even support yoga like as a career. There wasn't enough studios. I didn't teach in a yoga studio until I built one. It's actually a fact that there wasn't. When I built this studio, there was like, in this neighborhood, like a 10 mile radius, or five mile radius, there was like two studios. So if they already had all their teachers, you couldn't get in there unless you really, really wanted to. LA is one of the yoga I'll bet it is. More studios here than anywhere in the world, probably. In the world, probably. probably in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 